watching the UAP channel. Now, I've recently made a trip virtually to the Library of Congress, and I'm using a microphone effect that's called Narrator. So I'm talking like a narrator. Now the book that I'm reading is An Address Embracing the Early History of Delaware. The reason I chose this is it is dated 1846. And I thought to myself, why when everything seems to have begun after the date of 1850, well, what do I think that they would put in a book that is an address to an unknown group of people embracing the early history of Delaware? And why do they choose the word embracing? Isn't it simply the history? Well, let's find out. So now, we get started, and we're going to look at these documents. And I've already grown a bit tired of using the narrator voice although it does have a certain amount of charm. For some reason, I've got a bit of a southern accent going with my narrator voice. And I think it may be because I watched the movie Shawshank Redemption where the narrator, Morgan Freeman, talks about the life of Billy Dufresne. Now, I like the character Billy Dufresne, though his time in the movie is tragic. But that's not the purpose of this video. Okay, now I'm going to talk normally. So, the very beginning of this address, well, besides the title of it, the beginning is even more hmm, fascinating, I think. So I'm just going to read it to you. We are assembled today on a spot long since hallowed by the tears and prayers and affections of generations which are now sleeping with the dead. We are surrounded by the graves of those who once worshipped on this site and reared this edifice. Very few remain among the living who can remember the time when this sanctuary was built. This day completes 131 years since this spot was chosen as the site of the house of God. Wow, okay, let's stop there. Very few remain among the living who can remember the time when this sanctuary was built. And it was built 131 years prior. What? People lived to 131 years or more, rather, you know, probably 134 years at least to have an actual living memory. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's just since the site was chosen. So let's move on and see what else. Because I didn't catch that the first time around. I thought that was rather interesting. Okay, you'll have to excuse me. I'm having a little bit of coffee. This is early, early morning. And I hate it when I brew coffee and then I forget to drink it before it gets cold. Okay. Um, on the 10th of May... Okay, they throw names. Whatever. 
purchased it's interesting how they always say they purchased the land but from the very beginning they say they purchased the land even from the natives but they didn't purchase I mean purchase was it for sale uh, yeah, no, he says it, 1711, during the same year, a house of worship was erected on this spot. Of the men who engaged in this work, we know little except the names of those already mentioned who purchased this soil, the soil, and who also acted as a building committee. They acted, they didn't actually build it. I mean, if it's just some pioneers that show up um, what are you going to do you know you all get off the boat and then some people on the boat form a committee and expect everybody else who got off the boat to do all the work and then they are the building committee they're acting you know they're leave me alone I'm acting these fathers where are they question mark no one, no, or I mean, not one of the men who reared the former house, not one of those who ministered at its altar and within its walls, and not one of all who worshipped there survives. Yeah, it's been a, they would have been adults 131 years prior. So, okay, this this is either... Some people's lifespans were different, they can't do math, or they're even worse off in intellectually speaking, if they can't put that together. The very materials of that house of God are moldered back to dust. Oh. Okay. Unfortunately for their successors, no record of their transactions prior to 1732 remains except a solitary fact which was copied from the deed of this property and incorporated in the inscription for the erection of this house. Okay, so it's a different building then. It is a mournful reflection that the memory and the very names of most of the early worshippers on the spot have perished. Okay, whatever. Whatever of wealth or honor they gained, whatever of piety and devotedness they exhibited, let me zoom in here. Oh man, this thing is touchy. They have all been forgotten, and the clods, is he referring to them as clods? No. And the clods once heaped over their graves no longer mark the spot where their ashes repose. Okay. Um, so clods, <laughs> he's not calling them clods. He's talking about dirt. And so the could be the dirt heaped over their graves. See, this I found interesting because if you dig a grave, you fill the grave. Right? I don't think the English language has changed so much that this wouldn't... I mean, this is the only way I can interpret this. <sighs> to me, they had their graves dug and filled. And then he's saying clods or earth or dirt or mud, whatever heaped over top their graves, over their graves, over the grave markers, the gravestones, the spots. Okay? And then I think it's interesting that he says where their ashes repose. Repose is to lay in a state of per perpetual stillness, right? Usually it would mean dead. Um, but ashes now it, it's odd that it would be ashes I mean I know okay so create cremation is a thing I don't really care for it 
I, I think it muddles up history. I don't think cremation is the right way to deal with all this. Uh, but nevertheless, if you have ashes, then they put the ashes into a grave and then they heap clods over top of it or something happened. So I'm thinking like the reset event type thing would fit this description so far. Let's move on. How many warnings and appeals have been uttered on this spot? How vast the influence of truth on the minds of generations which have successfully worshipped here. Okay. How many immortal spirits have gone hence to the bar of God to receive their final doom? Hmm. I don't know what he means by bar. Oh, could the departed speak what scenes of seraphic joy and of keen and hopeless despair would the former worshippers on this spot disclose? Hmm. But the tomb from which no message ever comes holds them all in perpetual silence till the day of doom shall arrive. How solemn the thought that when an equal period of time shall have passed away, others will hold our possessions and succeed to our places in society and in the sanctuary while death will feed on us the clods will cover us, and the very names of many of us will be unknown except in the records of eternity. Hmm. So that could be interpreted both ways. Um, I find it interesting that he says, how many immortal spirits have gone to God to receive their final doom? What scenes of seraphic joy and of keen and hopeless despair hmm. would the former worshippers on the spot disclose? Mm, okay. It seems kind of bipolar to me, the way that's described. And then he says, um, but everything, practically everything about them is held in silence until the day of doom shall arrive. Hmm. Okay, he's talking about final judgment, I believe. How solemn the thought that when an equal period of time shall have passed away, others will hold our possessions and see, succeed to our places in society and the sanctuary while death will feed on us. Ugh. And the clot, so, okay. And many of us will be unknown except in the records of eternity. Well, see, that doesn't really make sense because don't they expect to have, like, family histories? Don't they expect to have, you know, church records of births, baptisms, confirmations, marriages, divorces, you know, remarriages, and, and you know, all these things. And then, like professional accomplishments, things, you know, positions within the Congress, whatever, you know, their names, and then things like that would continue, wouldn't they? Unless they were privy to some kind of a reset cycle. To this place where your fathers worshipped while many of you look back as a spot where truth pointed by the spirit of the eternal reached your heart and led you to God and hope and heaven, or where the Savior's call was unheeded and salvation spurned and your ruin sealed. Okay, so maybe he's just talking about, like, here you hear the gospel and you believe it or not. And if you don't believe it, then it's your doom. And then if you do believe it, then you're led towards, you'll be... You're on your way to God, and um, and seraphic joy. Is that what he said? 
Yeah. So, seraphic joy. Hmm, okay. Um, but our object on the present occasion is to give you an outline of the history of this region and especially of this congregation. You will bear in mind, you will bear it in mind that it is no easy task to gather up history where but few and imperfect records exist. Really? <laughs> if there are imperfections in these details, you will remember... Hmm. Oh, will we? This sounds like mind control right there. That it is the almost inevitable result attending any investigations where so few materials remain. Hmm. So that whole paragraph, well, not the first part of it, but the, the middle and end part of this entire paragraph are really mind-boggling to me. And by the way, I just have to say, I don't know where my English teachers are. If they happen, the, the various English teachers I had throughout the years, if they happen to be listening to this broadcast... They should smile. They don't know who it is. They don't know that I was their student. But um, don't um, don't underestimate your students, teachers. I held back quite a bit in English class. But anyway, I love tearing apart language. It's just really a lot of fun. Anyway, 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 um, you know, it's when you're forced to, to do these kinds of analyses in school, it's like, oh, it's just different. This is fun. Just think about what he's saying. An outline of history of this region. This is where they live. Who lived there before them? Not that many people, right? This is 1842. So... They have just over like a hundred years, maybe a little bit more of hi official history. And, you know, you start, you have these colonies that they had to, if you, I just know the bureaucratic European British, certainly, especially in the past, were meticulous and very much well, for lack of any other term, bureaucratic, they document all these things that they do meticulously, especially back then. You just didn't have that many options of things you could do for administration, so they would document the crap out of everything. And um, they had the printing press, right? And even before, I mean, with the scribes, it was a full-time job. These people... Do you want to work out in the fields or in the mines? Or if you're a scribe, then you're going to be scribing all day. So um, they documented stuff. I mean, come on. And here they are. What's their excuse? They don't have anything. They don't have any history. They have to tell. I mean, it, it doesn't make sense at all to me. He's saying, you know, that it's their own congregation. It's their own church, you know. Go to any church that has been around a hundred plus years. They're going to have a history. It's like, you know, what? They don't know who was the pastor of their own church going back, you know? They don't have anything written down or any, any familial knowledge, even just an oral history. We're not talking thousands of years. We're talking dozens or scores or even a hundred or two years. But... He's, but he does this suggestive talk, you know, it's like mind control stuff. You will bear in mind, it's no easy task to gather up history where but few and imperfect records exist. But why? Why would it even be that way? It should be an easy task. And wouldn't, if they're... Oh, well, I'll just move on, but... You know, he says, you will remember. It's like 9-11. Never forget. No. I can forget what I want to forget. 
and I can notice what I'm not supposed to notice, and I can remember what I'm not supposed to remember. So screw you with your you will remember. <laughs> that it is almost inevitable. It is the almost inevitable result attending any investigations where so few materials remain. The earliest permanent settlement seems to have been made by the Swedes in 1637. Christina, Queen of Sweden, formed the plan and sent Peter Menuhi as commander of the colony. This colony purchased purchased the lands on the west side of the Delaware from Cape Henlopen, called by them Paradise Point, to the falls of San Chicken or Trenton. Who the hell is Cape Henlopen? Is it a person? Is it a society? Is it a tribe? Is it a nation? Are they natives? Are they colonists? I mean, who did the Swedes Huh. Prior to this date, the Dutch were in possession of the lands on the eastern side of the river. Menuhi soon died, and Peter Hollander succeeded him. The seeds, or the seeds, the Swedes planted seeds. They settled on the Christina Creek, or Crick, or Crack. Some pe I, I don't know. I don't know why people say Crick. It's a creek. So when people say Crick, then I say Crack. So, um, so we're, we were talking about the Swedes, and then we talk about the Dutch. And in the, um, <laughs> they're talking about all this Christianity and gospel and purity and in close combination with the New Haven Colony and all their fundamental articles and under the jurisdiction of the settlements, da 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 da, then they both are, quote, taken under the protection of the legislature of the United New England Colonies, which I have, that's a term I've never heard, as a United States well, citizen, I, uh, United, I, I'm really a, a citizen of a particular state. But anyway, um, if you want to think of it as the United States, um, but th it was already that. It was the United New England Colonies, which, which already gives a an idea of like independence in a way there, but not. <sighs> Just like we live in today. You know, the state I live in, it sounds independent, but it's not. Um, it sounds like mafioso protection, <laughs> you know. Hey, after much annoyance from the Dutch, the New Englanders really went beyond annoyance. <laughs> hey, we, we were thinking, what if something was to happen to us? We wouldn't want such an unfortunate series of events to occur in your neighborhood. We will offer to protect you. Um, and built a fort. So then they built a star for fort. So when they have the protection and everything's all settled, well, they're still, quote, building a fort, which was called New Gothenburg. Okay. Here a church built of wood was consecrated by Campanus. Sounds like a Roman name. But why do they specify built of wood? Because... Wouldn't it be a no-brainer that it would be built of wood? 
Mosquito Fort. <laughs> so they built the fort, but then they abandoned it. See, already you get into the abandoned forts. And this one wasn't made of wood because they didn't say it was made of wood. There's a the Swedes, they say, erected a fort. Helsingsborough. Helsingsborough. This fort was called Meigenborg or Mosquito Fort. The Swedes built it and abandoned it on account of the annoyance of the mosquitoes. Whatever. Just talk to the Native Americans. They have ways of dealing with the mosquitoes. What are they, idiots? <laughs> Nobody said, well, dang these mosquitoes. Um, shouldn't we maybe talk to these people walk around who aren't bothered by the mosquitoes so much? Like, what do you guys do? Rub oils on your skin? Or what kind of things are you doing there? No, no, they don't even think about that. But already at 16... Uh, 1646 or 1651... No, it was before 1651. And they have an abandoned fort built not out of wood and then they keep changing the names of places like there's fewer people they built it supposedly and they can't decide what to name it they just keep fort casimir the remains so now they're, they're, and then there's one in ruins already the remains of which are still near the bank of the river a short distance from town um, Newcastle. I mean, why would you name some place Newcastle if it's not looking like castles? <laughs> and here comes another guy with like a Roman name, John Claudius Rising. Huh who afterwards became governor of the colony. Okay. So, I don't know. I was just looking at this at first for a bit before I move on to the, the main thing. Um... That I wanted to talk about. But I just find it fascinating just to read through this stuff. Um, how they're purchasing lands and they have, they have huge forts and think castle like places that are abandoned and in ruins when they're just settling. You know, they're settling what it would be like the forest or the wilderness, right? Supposedly. Hmm. And they just talk about purchasing lands and then the, the lands are called like like new this city or new castle, you know, it implies, the implication is that there's already a city there or a castle there. Um, I think the way it works is like when they arrive in these places, they look at it and they say, well, this reminds me of Madrid, Spain. And so then they call it new, Mad new Madrid, but they, it gets screwed up and they call it New Madrid, you know. And then they destroy the crap out of it and build up the crap we have today. And then it bears no resemblance to the city it's named after. It never made sense to me. It never made sense why these towns and cities and villages in the Midwest and in Texas and almost like all over New England, they're named after towns or cities and areas in Europe, but they bear no resemblance to those places. 
you know, why would you, why would you name something new, uh, you know, new, what was it, new, uh, new castle if it didn't have a castle, or new York if it didn't resemble York. It just doesn't make sense to me, uh, except when I think about or realize that it probably did resemble Madrid or Paris or whatever um, before it was totally destroyed. Okay, so uh, let me show you. This made me think of something. So, okay, I'll just stop here and I'll show you something else. Okay, one more thing on this. <laughs> At least one more thing, but... Um, so here, it's very interesting on this uh, page 10. So here's uh, some story they're telling in the, the Dutch and the Dutch Swedes and the Fort Nassau and 15 leagues and whatever and purchased lands from the Indians. And apparently the Indians had put up for sale signs. I'm not sure if they used real estate brokers. Um... You know, if they list the properties by acreage in the MLS system, um, you know, the multiple listing system and uh, how they pay their commissions on sales, things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, did the Indians have deeds drawn up and whatever? Um but here, the, here comes some BS. I can just sniff out these BS stories so quickly. Um, during the attempt of these ambassadors at negotiation, the governor and council of Maryland presented them a copy of Lord Baltimore's patent. The ambassadors very shrewdly alleged that his royal majesty of England had granted to Lord Baltimore lands which had not been seated and taken up before, only inhabited by a certain barbarous people, the Injuns. And they bought it. <laughs> oh my gosh. But as the South River called Nassau and by the English Delaware had been taken up and appropriated long before by virtue of a commission from the high and mighty states general of the United Provinces and settled... I have no idea. I have to stop there. I have never heard of this group. Ever. In the very name of it, the English Delaware... But they're admitting that it was inhabited by a previous civilization. Right here, they're admitting it. Well, they're saying that it was inhabited by Europeans, but that's not true. Here, just let's, I'll just read it, but bear in mind that as I read it here, I have no idea who this is even supposed to be. The high and mighty states general of the United Provinces. Whatever. Okay, so I'm just going to read on, read it. Okay. But as the South River called Nassau and by the English Delaware had been taken up and appropriated long before by virtue of a commission from the high and mighty states general of the United Provinces and settled not by Indians a.k.a. Native Americans, but by a Christian people, parentheses, Native Americans, also called Indians in error, can be Christian people, but whatever. 
Okay, I'm just going to try to read it without interrupting myself. By virtue of a commission from the high and mighty states general of the United Provinces and settled not by Indians but by a Christian people that therefore the grant of Lord Voldemort, Voldemort, Baltimore, Baltimore, Lord Baltimore could have no reference to Delaware. So they were bamboozled. What? You got us? Why we shouldn't have believed them ambassadors? Why they took us for a ride, you scallywags? The arrival of Sir Robert Carr, the future uh, eponymous car fire, uh, would be named after him in 1664, <laughs> and the surrender. By the way, the car fire in um, California, they say, was started by literally a car, like C A R with one R car fire and then it spread car fire oh my gosh it's just the layers of ridiculousness the arrival of sir robert carr in 1664 and the surrender of the delaware to the forces under his command put this claim of lord voldemort baltimore lord baltimore at rest until the arrival of william penn and william penn shows up what the hell why, you scallywags? What kind of skullduggery is going on around here? Then the claim was renewed. The Duke of York was now James II, King of England, and this claim was referred to a committee on plantations. If you're lost, join the club. In November, 1685, this committee reported that the land granted to Lord Voldemort, Baltimore, Lord Baltimore, who names their child Lord? Their first name is Lord. Is that what happens, or is it a title? I mean, I really don't know, because I've come across it, like, Whatever. You know, Jermaine Jackson of the Jackson Five allegedly, you know, named all of his children in some form of Jermaine. So the girls have kind of peculiar names, but the girls, because he had a lot of kids. It's like George Foreman named all his children George, Georgina, Georgie. Georgery and all those things. But uh, Jermaine Jackson named one of his children Jer Majesty. So here, finally, we get to the truth of the matter where they describe the situation as they found it, which I've been saying now for quite some time. And that is that... Um, Okay, I'll just read it. In November 1685, this committee reported that the land granted to Lord Baltimore was such as was inhabited by savages, but that the tract now claimed by him had been planted by Christians antecedent to this grant. But to avoid all difficulties on the subject, they decided that the peninsula should be divided into two equal parts by a line drawn from the latitude, whatever. So to carry out this decision, commissioners were appointed to form a map of the country, which map was sent to England and made the basis of the agreement in 1732. Now, I could be mistaken, but I have looked for maps like this type of map in the United Kingdom's archives, the Royal Archives, whatever, I forgot what it's called exactly, but it's their version of the Library of Congress. And um, I didn't find diddly squat. 
you know, you go back to around, again, 1850, and then the records become, first of all, they, they cease to be actual photo records of a document that was written by a scribe on a scroll or printed by a printer on paper. It's so not a, like before 1850, you're not getting scans or photos of actual documents that would resemble like, let's say, the Declaration of Independence, right? It just becomes where it's just a record that they have. It's It's a, if anything, it's just PDF text that was typed in on the digital database, but then the record itself referenced is a record, not the actual original document. Do you know what I mean? It's a recreation, it's a a printing, it's a summary or a, maybe not a summary, but just a replication. I just found that fascinating, you know, so if you go and look for this map, you're probably not going to find it. And the reason is the map will show the city laid out uh, like it is today. Now in New Zealand, I, in Christchurch, well it was, was it Auckland for sure, and I think Christchurch as well, I found the surveyor's maps from around 1840 and it showed the cities in their complete like almost as they are today I mean the old part of the city with all the nice architecture was all there and that was before the first boats arrived so how did they explain that well you could watch my video about well a couple videos I made about New Zealand and yeah, in Australia is the same thing, and South Africa is the same thing. But mostly I focused on, um, I think it was Auckland, New Zealand. And uh, although the video may be titled Christchurch, it's both. But they said, oh, well, that was the surveyor's planning. So the surveyor is looking at supposedly, you know, native lands, you know, just walking through forests and, and, and tall grass and stuff like that. And then he's just planning out, you know what, I think a nice, nice castle-like cathedral goes here and a big, huge government building goes there and the street will go here and there will be drainage and there will be canals here and there's got to be a bridge here and all these different things that he does. And guess what? It gets built in two or three years exactly to his design. What a genius, my gosh. He's like the, the city planner's city planner. You know, like he, he's a, a legend among city planners and just a surveyor. You know why? Just what I was talking about here on page 12. Here we go. On the 9th of November, 1768, the commission ratified their map and plan of surveys and divisional lines embracing according to the decree of Lord Hardwick, the Chancellor. All the articles of agreement made in 1732. Um, so they call it a plan. And I could be wrong, but when they call it a plan, they really do have what is supposed to be a plan on there, which is a detailed map of the roads, the buildings, the drainage ditches, the canals, the bridges. It Sometimes it goes into such detail as saying like how much clearance is under the bridges for boats and things like that. All built up, basically. And they refer to the people living there not as settlers or builders or you know, 
I mean, gosh, wouldn't these people be having to make quarries and set up transportation and all this stuff? But they just go in and they're tenants. They're, cl they're claimants. They claim their founders, tenants and claimants. Um, and they purchase the land from these groups that I've never, they acquire the lands from these established groups I've never heard of. Let's go back to page 11 and see what that was called. Um, um, may, oh, it's further back. It's uh, page 10 and they... Yes, they got it from, um, not from the barbarous people or the Tartarus people. Uh, here it is. They got it or it had already been taken up and appropriated long before by virtue of a commission from the high... This is all capitalized. The high and mighty states general of the United Provinces and settled not by Indians, but by a Christian people. So there you go. Oh, and then before I go past it, bet now on page 11. Like, what the heck's going on here? Uh... There's all this confusion about who owns what, who knows what, and they say it's because somebody died and he left his minor, his son, in charge, but his son was a minor. Um, and then they fumbled around who's going to do the boundary lines and fruitless attempts, and they're just a bunch of dorks, don't know what they're doing. And then they, their commissioners finally employed Mason and Dixon, of the you know the Mason Dixon line, they had just returned from the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, where they had been to observe the transit of Venus. Okay because they didn't know how the st stuff worked down south yet, apparently. And they succeeded in establishing a line between Delaware and Maryland, which has since been called the Mason-Dixon line. So there you go for that. And then here at the bottom of page 12, the settlement within the bounds of this congregation began at an early period. Yeah, understatement. 